Okay class, my name is Dr. Harbin. Uh, this is our first um, parasitology lecture and today we're going to be talking specifically about Plasmodium falciparum. Okay, it's one of the one of several Plasmodium uh, species that is responsible for malaria transmission, okay? Um, so a little bit of history about this parasite. Okay, um, so Malaria parasites were discovered by Charles Luis Alphonse Laveron in Constantine, Algeria in the year 1880. And I put a star next to his name here because he went on to win a Nobel Prize for his uh, research. Um, William H. Welch named one of the tertian, which is a, the fever every other day from this parasite, um, Plasmodium falciparum in 1897. And from 1898 to 1899, Giovanni Battista Grass and a team of Italian investigators collected Anopheles clavigar mosquitoes, which is the specific species, which is the vector for these parasites. He allowed them to feed on malaria patients. After that, these mosquitoes were sent to feed on healthy volunteers who ended up developing malaria, which helped with their research. Uh, today, the life cycles of vectors of Plasmodium falciparum are studied and well understood. Um, continuous research and commitment will hopefully lead to malaria elimination and ultimately eradication. So, by the way, my my papers here are sort of bland, I guess you'd say, but that's for your own good. So you take notes. This stuff's going to be on the test. All right. So next, let's talk about a little bit about the morphology. So I drew these I drew these two pictures here. Um, this is specifically how they look when they're in the red blood cells, right? And th when they're here, they're called trophozoites. They're basically growing and absorbing the nutrients in the red blood cells, okay? Um, and compared to the other species of Plasmodium, uh, Plasmodium falciparum has, has more but smaller trophozoites, which are the things I just showed you, and the distinct crescent-shaped gametocytes. So moving on to the phylogenetics of Plasmodium falciparum. So I have a little, I guess, road map here because it's, it's a little confusing, but earlier molecular phylogenetic studies showed that Plasmodium falciparum was related to two avian parasites suggesting the transfer was from birds to humans. Okay, later on a study showed that the closest relative was P. Raikinawi, uh, the parasite isolated from uh, chimpanzees. So, in the most recent work, discovered that Plasmodium falciparum is in many primate species. So, there's still much research to be completed to determine where Plasmodium falciparum actually came from. But it is clear that it can use a host, uh, a human and a primate host. And next, um, I'm going to ask the class this. So, pause the video after I ask this question and answer it for yourself, then come back. So what would be the gram stain of this particular parasite? Would it be gram negative or gram positive? Okay. So if you pause the video, then I hope you answered that it's neither. Because gram staining for Plasmodium falciparum is not possible because it doesn't possess a cell wall, right? Okay. So instead, in my lab, for example, we use uh, Gizma, the preferred stain. It helps us the detection of certain morphological features of uh, Plasmodium falciparum. Alright, so on to ecology. So I drew two pictures here of two different mosquitoes, okay? This one, it's, a little, it's, it's mean, right? Sad face. And this one, it's, it's a little happier, right? I'd rather be around this guy. Okay, so in regards to the ecology of Plasmodium falciparum, um, all of the Plasmodium species must have a mosquito vector in order to make it uh, make it to the next host. Okay, that's where they sort of um, mature a little bit and grow. Okay, then they have to be transferred via blood meal. We'll talk about that life cycle here in a minute. So there's not much evidence to determine that the mosquito's behavior is affected by the Plasmodium. So and the reason I did the smiley face and sad face is because their efforts to eradicate malaria worldwide all right and so there's two there's two sides on this story so one side supports eradication of of the this mosquito species completely okay that means no no way that this thing can 
can give give this parasite to any other host, okay? So, and then the other side is more on the prevention, the prevention of the passing of the parasite instead of complete eradication. And so I guess a way to look at it is if this mosquito was completely eradicated, wouldn't you think this would leave a predator without prey or a plant without a pollinator, for example? Because a mosquito is vital in many uh, ecological systems. So the topic is pretty controversial. Um, malaria, you know, is a huge, a huge uh, issue globally. And so I will let you decide on which side you're on, okay? So a little bit about the metabolism of Plasmodium falciparum. Um, they, under, they have a, an ability to metabolize hemoglobin. All right, and so I drew this. I drew this globular hemoglobin over here to remind you of the structure, and these are red blood cells. Okay, just poorly drawn, but so during the erythrocytic stage of the life cycle, Plasmodium falciparum uses hemoglobin as a food source, and hemozoin is formed here, and we'll also talk about that later because it's very important. So carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, during erythrocytic stage, the parasite produces its energy mainly through anaerobic glycolysis with uh, pyruvate going to lactate, okay? And once again, this is what they look like inside the red blood cell. And I just drew the little disc in the middle to remind you of the, the donut shape of a red blood cell, for lack of a better term. So the protein metabolism. Um, research is currently being conducted to help understand the hypothesis that Plasmodium falciparum obtains most of its amino acids from the host or by by degrading hemoglobin. And the the studies have found that Plasmodium falciparum doesn't have an enzyme for the biosynthesis of amino acids, which would, you know, help help with this hypothesis. All right, so let's talk about the life cycle of this guy. So there's a lot going on here and we'll kind of just this is straight off the CDC website, so I kind of just want to briefly talk about what's going on. So we'll start here. We'll start here, right? Okay. I'm sorry this is a little hard to read. I uh, couldn't get it to uh, enlarge at all. So I'll, I'll read what's going on. So here, a mosquito um, takes takes a blood meal. We'll, we'll start up here, actually. Okay. So a mosquito takes a blood meal um, onto a human, right? And so it had previously been infected with the, um, the parasite. Okay, this, the, the, it injects the spora, sporozoites. These go to the liver cells, right, where they kind of incubate and hang out. Um, they start to mature, so that's here, and they, they form what's known as a, a schizont, okay? These eventually get so full of the parasite that they rupture and release, release merozoites, okay? These it's now they now make their way into the blood so this this is a representation of a of a couple hanging out around a red blood cell okay so they penetrate the red blood cell the immature trophozoites um, are now in in here and before I talked about how they were they start eating basically eating the hemoglobin right for energy so this is called uh, the ring stage immature trophozoites okay they start to grow they grow they grow this is an this is another place where they're schizonts again. They're growing, still growing. They rupture. Okay, when they rupture, they go look for another red blood cell. This continues continuously happens. Okay, that's why the ring arrows are here. Continuously goes on, and that's what causes the pathology of malaria. So here we have gametocytes. These form. Okay, male, female. Okay, so say then the, another mosquito comes. Takes, takes a blood meal on us, we're already infected. That mosquito picks up these gametocytes, male and female, and guess what? They're back inside the mosquito to start the cycle all over again, right? Form microgametes, okay, into macrogametes, into the oocinet, into the oocyst, and then the ruptured oocyst releases the sporozoites, and then the whole cycle happens over again, okay? So the, the parasites basically hang out inside the mosquito until they're mature, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they're mature enough, then they make their way to the salivary glands where they, where this is how they're actually transferred when that mosquito takes a blood meal onto us or another organism. All right, so I want to spend a little bit of time of, of, on the molecular biology of these guys. It's very important. 
and I would think about taking notes of this because it's going to be on your exam. Okay. So there's two main factors that allow Plasmodium falciparum to survive in the host. So the first important one is um, the the P falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein one. All right, that's a mouthful. I know it's important. You'll see why. Okay, so the pathogenesis involved with this protein has to do with the way P falciparum's ability to remodel the host red blood cells by exporting the PFEMP1 to the red blood cell surface. Okay, this PFEMP1 mediates the adhesion of infected red blood cells to host cells by interacting with the surface receptors. All right, this this causes structures called knobs to form on the outside surface of the infected red blood cells. So these are now, think of this as now a regular donut, and this is now a donut with glaze on the outside, a sticky donut, okay? Sticky donut. <clears throat> so, the sticky surface of this knob causes the infected uh, red blood cells to adhere to endothelial cells in the blood vessels. All right, so think about we're tr this, the normal red blood cell travels, you know, it travels easily through the, through the vessels, okay? Imagine this, imagine a bunch of these sticky donuts tumbling down a tube. They're going to get hung up on each other, right? And that's exactly what happens. So these, a, a, some, some sort of a buildup basically happens of these, right? So the idea behind this is for the parasite's ability to survive. So this allows the parasite to buy some time and avoid being cleared out by the spleen because when when blood when red blood cells are you know ready to be recycled they go to the spleen for recycling right okay so this uh, this buys time for them to release their merozoites which basically baby parasites from the red blood cell and affect more erythrocytes so if they're not ready to mature in the life cycle like I said and rupture then being able to stick onto the side of the wall is going to allow them some extra time to mature so they can release when they want to. Okay, and the most serious pathology from a buildup of these sticky red blood cells is called cerebral malaria. Okay, and this prevents oxygenation of the oxygenation of the brain, and we know what happens when that occurs, right? You're dead. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is hemozoin. All right, we talked about this earlier from the metabolism of hemoglobin. So this is a crystalline pigment that's formed in the digestive vacuole of plasmodium as a product of hemoglobin catabolism. Plasmodium digests about 80% of hemoglobin in the host red blood cell, which it utilizes as an essential source of nutrients and energy. This process, this process generates heme, which is actually toxic to the parasite, right? So since plasmodium is unable to excrete free heme and detoxify it, the parasite aggreg aggregates the heme into an insoluble crystal, hemozoin. So hemozoin then accumulates when erythrocytes rupture, all right? The accumulation and phagocytic cells of the immune system is used to diagnose malaria. So this process of forming the hemozoin crystals is one of the most essential survival techniques for P. falciparum because without this, the parasite would end up dying from buildup of toxic heme, right? Because they can't process the heme. Um, and we'll take this moment, I guess, to talk about symbiosis. So when we think of malaria, you know, and parasites, we don't think of a, a real happy environment I suppose uh, so um, so there's not really a symbiosis between a host and a partner right so because P. falciparum it's, been, it's found in many animals but only has really devastating effect on, on humans right the pathology so the parasite uses red blood cells as its source of energy while giving nothing back to the human host which is therefore not a definition of symbiosis um, so I think it would be important uh, to talk to take a moment to talk about sickle cell anemia at, the, at this time. So sickle cell anemia is a blood disease in which red, red, red blood cells reveal an abnormal sickle or crescent shape like this, okay? So normal, sickle. Um, so it's an inherited disorder caused by single base substitution DNA sequence for the gene encoding the protein that carries oxygen in red blood cells. So in recent research, it has been determined that Plasmodium falciparum still infects the red blood cells, but are unable to cause pathology to the human host. So we, we may, you may or may not know that sickle cell has been an adaptation, 
of people for sub, uh, sub-Saharan Africa to be able to combat malaria. And it's an evolutionary change that's occurred over many years. Um, basically, it was thought at one point that sickle cell would just not cause a parasite to hang on to the red blood cell, but in fact, the from research, the sickle cell still is infected with the parasite, but the host is now tolerant to the parasite. So you could still have uh, many parasites in you, but you won't, you know, have the pathology from uh, m- the malarian pathology, okay? Which is, you know, fever, sickness, nausea, and eventually death if untreated. All right. So I want to talk about for a second, I kind of want to summarize everything we talked about and just take a second and think about why do we even care about P. falciparum or malaria in general. And I'm going to use this as a broad, broad um, chance to talk about malaria as a whole since Plasmodium falciparum is the number one species of parasite that causes malaria, okay? It's the most, um, the most common parasite that causes malaria, right? So the CDC, World Health Organization, and UNICEF, these are big, these are big um, worldwide global, you know, initiatives to think about malaria and other uh, bad, bad diseases that are going on in the world, right? So some facts about malaria. In 2015, 212 million cases of malaria were reported and 429,000 deaths. Okay, that's a lot of deaths. A lot of deaths. So children are at a higher risk than adults. Um, Two-thirds of the deaths of all those 429,000 deaths were under five years old. Okay, that's a lot of children. So one of the initiatives going out um, to these areas in need are spraying of their homes with, you know, insecticide to repel the mosquitoes. Um, there's insecticide tents, nets that they sleep under to prevent them from um, getting infected while they sleep. And there's also uh, some drugs out now that sort of um, not necessarily cure it, but help with the symptoms, um, help help the help the life cycle of P. falciparum not be able to be completed, right? So, and, but on a bright note, mortality rates are falling. Uh, since 2010, there's been a, a decrease 29% of malaria globally and a decrease of 35% in children under five. That's huge. Okay, so these initiatives are working. And why do we care about this? Is because this is going to continue to be an issue globally, right? Um, and like I said, there's two sides in the, of the situation. You can think about it however you want and take your own opinion about it. But um, it is an issue, a huge issue. And we need people like the CDC, World Health Organization, UNICEF, you know, implementing these programs. And we need more research going on to figure out how exactly can uh, Plasmodium falciparum be, be stopped, you know, with or without the eradication of the host. But it seems it seems like, um, as evolution has shown us, that even if, say, we were to eradicate all the Anopheles species of mosquitoes, right, just done, then don't you think that, as we've seen in the past, things will survive? Plasmodium will figure out how to manipulate another host, um, another vector in order to be transferred to their host. Um, So that's something to think about. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot. Um, Don't forget to study for your test, okay? Don't put it off to last minute. Go back over these and pause the video, take notes, and that's what it's for. See ya.